We made it. We're here. We made it. Uh, Bruce, you need to take over. You need to be the host. I did. I did. I did. I did. 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 No, 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 I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Recording stopped. Oh, there we go. You see now, why does it just stop the recording when I do that? Uh, because it just does. But it's still streaming. The host is in charge. Yeah, it's still streaming. It's fine. I mean, the stream is the recording, right? As far as mm -hmm. I can tell. So um, here we go, right? Here we go. I recognize all these places. I do too. Did so you I take these you photos? Just, uh, no, I didn't did you take find? these photos. I just found photos. them on the internet. Yeah, I could have uh, though. I could have. I was going to say, you've been here, done that. You saw that yeah, baboon yeah. sitting on that uh, Quite wall there, possibly. Hmm? Quite possibly. <laughs> he looks pretty settled there. He's probably an institution. Uh, uh, so the Southern Peninsula, there's, there's um, quite a few baboons. They, they're wild, basically. Um, but they do visit. You need meditation. to be careful around these guys, right? They're like, they're yeah, not. Yeah, they're wild, uh, they're wild they're animals. Not, they're not pets. Yeah. yeah. And they're um, too darn smart. They're very smart. And they're very destructive. Mm. Um, mm. They're, they're, they're becoming a pest. Well, they have been a pest for a long time because mm. they break into houses and they absolutely trash the places. Wow. So I thought I would show pictures because this is where we're going to be in just like five weeks or something. That's something like that. It's very close weeks, now. Hey? Five or six weeks, depending on when you get there. Yeah. 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 <sighs> But hey, I'm making progress on the uh, production side of things. I sent Bruce a sample of the openings for the presentation. Oh, they look, they look very good. Mm -hmm. I really put my good. hand up. Very good. You like them? Yeah, I do like. Them. I like the yeah. second one the best. I mean, that's. I think that's what I'm going to go with. So, if you want to see what the openings look like, <laughs> you need to either attend or sign up for the uh, videos. Yeah. There you but, go. Yeah, I'm quite pleased with the whole situation at the moment. So with that, we will move forward. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in Clarion Live land. This is the Clarion Live weekly webinar, see it, learn it, and share it. This is uh, webinar number 673. We're getting close to 700, aren't we? We are. Yeah, by the end of the year, thereabouts, just after. You think so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's August 12th today, 2022. The clearing date is 80946. All webinars are recorded and available at clearinglive.com. Please join us on Skype. And we are currently live streaming to four people, three of whom like what they're seeing so far. So they're huh, liking the good. penguins. Like that. That's, that's very good. Very good. They're liking that. And, um, and I'm thinking, by the way, we're, we're probably closer to March, February, March, before we hit the 700. Yeah, yeah I think early probably. next year. Yeah, there's still yeah, 20 Because it's like go, yeah. 26, 27, which is a little over half a year, and we're. I just wanted to point okay. out that uh, Mike had a very successful webinar last last week. He did. Yeah. I heard all about it. A million views, hey? <laughs> Not a million. A thousand but... <laughs> likes. 810 views. I'm not it's sure. It's a how million many likes. Karen views, to be fair. It's a million current yes, views. Yes, yes, it's, it's all about oh. leverage. <laughs> it's like dog years. A sense of scale. <laughs> um, so anyway, even though I know the title isn't right, I guess we could move forward. Um, I left it because I want to see if it's the title that attracted people. It had the word game in it and it had the word test in it. And maybe that triggered some... Let's see what happens. Algorithm, to algorithm on YouTube. Could be. What I want to know is, did they enjoy it at some level? Or did they were like, what? Why in the hell am I here? I feel like people <laughs> did they pause came in? for a while and think about it. Like, hmm, well, maybe this, maybe it's the start of a cult following, Mike, where that, people that come much, to yeah. the Friday webinars. Yeah. They know nothing about programming, nothing about coding. And I'm just going to sit there and prognosticate on all of the uh, all of my <laughs> <know>? wisdom. <laughs> they should have come for the festival of knowledge. That's what they should have. <laughs> oh, they missed they that should've. one. Yeah. Oh, Where's the algorithm see, for that? See links so. that way. <laughs> for the that festival way. of knowledge. Right. Okay, that was a six, 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 the webinar number 666, six, six, in six, case six. you need to yeah, look for yeah. it. That's right. Uh, very quickly through here, uh, we have hosts. John Hickey, that's me. Bruce Johnson is next. Andy hey. Welton is not here. No, Andy gets the trumpet, uh, the wah-wah trumpet. And then Mike Hansen is... I am here. 
and that and my Sick. biggest fan is still here. Listen, he's to always back. here. He's always here. Very enthusiastic. That's a secret. Fella. He's got a good Remarkable. solid clap too. I like that. Uh, we have rules. All attendees are muted. That means we can't hear you. Type your questions into the questions box. We'll read them to the presenter. If you want to speak, we encourage you to do so. Raise your hand. Type the question box. Finally, some foods are meant to be eaten with your fingers. Follow the lead of the host or hostess. So if you're not sure what to do, look over at Bruce or whoever is hosting that particular meal, I guess. Are we going to have a hostess, though? This is what, what I, I need doing. to know. Are, is, is, should have you just okay. said host? Oh, sis, or will, sis, yeah, oh. oh, I understand that. But I'm saying in our case, is there even the option to have, do, will we have a hostess? I know, I know I'm, I, I'm assuming some of our attendees will be female. Uh, being programmers and old and silly, we, uh, we tend to be a, a rather male group, generally speaking, but there are usually some females showing up. Will we have a female hostess? I don't know. You'll it's have to come and question. see. It's a very good Which question. Which is why it says host or hostess, because yes, yes. we don't know. But anyway, make sure, don't just dive in and start, do, 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 you know, do, 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 do. wait. Step back, take a breath. Yeah. See what's now, going what on. about foods that normally would be eaten with fingers, like pizza, for example? I generally prefer to eat with a <laughs> with a fork and knife. Is that a faux pas? Feel free, feel free, Mike. Is that okay? You if eat you're the it host, any way you want. No, In I'm fact, not. if you're the host and you eat it with a knife and fork, everyone else has to as well. Yeah, yeah. Follow suit. Can I be there the host go. some night and we have pizza? That's what I want. I want to see everybody. <laughs> well, we'll, do, we'll make you the host for the for the night we have a bry. Good luck with that, because oh, bry's no, no, no. all finger food. Yeah, it's, no, no, they, it's, they it's just sure. designed to get your hands around it and and get in there like a caveman style. That's yeah, it. very go. very much so. Anyway, today um, Mike Hansen is with us again with Let's Make a Game and Tested Part Two. Although that's not actually what's happening, but. Well, again, yeah, we'll, we we'll are see. making a game and we're testing to make sure we that are the doing game works. So this is true. Yes. This <laughs> okay. Is true. All right. Maybe Last the wrong order, but it. it is true. <laughs> All right. We're testing first and then we're making the game, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, next week, Bruce, the next X-Files. Is that right? Is that X-Files 4. Got to come yeah. sooner or later. I have to let it go. So I've been working on it for a long, long time now. So uh, it's not what I would say finished complete but it's certainly past useful um it's very useful and i'm using it and it's people are starting to say well how do i do this how do I do it? and it's kind of like yeah well it's easier so it needs to get out the door and start getting used so we'll talk about that next friday yep and i'll i'll be uh, hosting the webinar under protest because i'm not a fan of x anything and we need to we need to stop enabling people to use XML. XML. Uh, XML. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't XML. used it for a long time, I have to admit. I've been a JSON guy for exactly. But look uh, how much time Bruce uh, spent on it. I mean, look how much time he spent on it. You're just like, <laughs> Could have done other things. Done no, else. I, yeah. Jason, absolutely. First prize every day. But, but, but unfortunately, sometimes there are a lot of systems XML, out yeah. there where you have to use XML. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, that's the old XML. Yeah, 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 yeah. We live yeah, in a world. I have a dream. When every my... interface will be <laughs> judged by the curliness of its brackets. There you go. Yeah, well. Or the short and curlies. There you go. Anyway, uh, it'll happen one way or the other. It'll happen. You're muted, uh, Bruce, if you're still talking or if you're not. Or you're, no, I, was, I wasn't saying oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, you're not. Sorry, I, I just realized yeah. I was looking at the wrong screen. Never mind. Okay. And then Mark, uh, fingers crossed, will be with us on August 26th. Andy, fingers crossed, will be with us on September 2nd. And then Bajan uh, volunteered to do a TS Plus update on the 9th. And then oh, we cool, are cool. gone for weeks and weeks and weeks. And if you want to see us, you got to join CIDC 2020. So we're not doing it. So that's the last uh, last regular webinar until the conference. Yeah, because wow. I'm yeah. Take, here on the 14th. Break. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'll cool. be the it'll be the, the what is it the 16 john will already be here and then I, the 20 this is when i leave it's right here yeah yes. and then the, yeah, 23rd right. the 23rd is, is in is the conference the, is, yes that's true so really we're only missing one session well two sessions 60 well i, I mean we'll be at yeah. the conference so i guess we'll be back you won't be back by the 30th john no we'll be nope. back seven i don't get back until here, I get back oh, yeah. here. so one before we'll be one back. after Got seven it. seven october we'll be back seven october cool so that's what's happening. Um, yeah. And depending upon how we proceed today, we may be continuing this one in October. We'll have when to we get over here. Okay. On the 7th. I have five weekends.
and finish preparing. Hmm. I'm, a, I'm not. Uh, I'm not anxious or anything. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. I'm just we'll gonna get wait. Point in getting anxious, you know, it's just my. That's what Mike it? does. No. Just wing it. Yeah. Yeah, most of the time I do. Well, I, well, for the conferences, I try and be a little bit prepared. But, uh, <laughs> but for, for today, I'm, I'm winging it because it's fun seem, to just wing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But if you see t Mike typing furiously in the session before his session, that's him doing the slides. Hmm? Slides? Heck, no, I'm going to be writing code for the slides. <laughs> <laughs> Testing and all that stuff. Is it actually going to work? Is it finished? Oh, my God, it's not finished. Okay. No. Yeah. No. There it is. I should I should change this. I mean, it looks rather barren, doesn't it? This whole slide. Wow. Yeah, yeah. We all can the have excitement to that's that. actually uh, going on here. It's a good color, though. It's got a lot. Of, it's got a lot of mustard essence to it. I like that. Yeah, it's kind of a real zing to it. Yeah. And the confirmed part, I think we've known that for a while, so I could probably take yes. that out of there. I'm glad that's. I'm glad you pointed <laughs> that out, John. That it is in fact confirmed. <laughs> it is confirmed. <laughs> So anyway, very exciting. Um, we'll move on. I just suggest you if change you... the word confirm to the very uh, a demonstrative phrase, uh, be there. Just be there. Command okay. people. Yes. In person or in. virtually, Or right? tune in. There we go. Tune in. Be there or tune in. There we go. That'll work. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. OK. Um, you can still sign up. I guess that's all. Good. Can Only still sign up. There's say. one or two places. That we're we're gonna have to cut off physical signups. Well, I mean, soon-ish. I suppose where we. What, what are we up to now? Uh, so there's think, a few guys uh, can't come because of hmm. because of um, flights and stuff. So I think oh, we've so got fifty six people. Okay. There. So we're still we're still shooting for the sixty mark then. Yeah, something like that. Something okay. like that. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a couple of spaces. So, um, but we do need to give numbers to hotels and things like that pretty quick. Um, and and we're now out of block booking season. So if you if you are planning to come, you do need to you need you need to expedite that because you will need to book hotel rooms. And the hotel that we no longer have a block booking, right? That that came to an end. So whatever's available is available. If you ask really nicely, they might give you a special rate. Um, but even that's not guaranteed. So. Um, and the hotel will fill up because there are other events happening in the area, uh, both that weekend and the following week. Uh, there's a big water polo tournament in the area. So, um, yeah, if you are planning to come, which I think you should, because I think you'll enjoy it. Um, do get your registration up and, and find the hotel and get a booking in ASAP. Cool. And if you can't Very join cool. us in Cape Town, which was, is sad, it's sad trombone time, you can still join us online. We will take online registrations pretty much all the way up to the event and probably after, actually. So um, it's $300 for four days worth of material plus the 12 interim on uh, streams. I think it's excellent value. It's cheaper than any other conference you're going to get. So go for it. Good way to dip your foot in the water. If you've never done one of these, that might be a good, good, good time to try. Yes. Okay, we move on. Uh, there was no an Antis user group meeting this week, but there will be one next week. Um, there was an open webinar, and Bruce was there, and I was there. I was. And, and we answered questions. There were questions. We, we answered, answered questions. questions. <laughs> we answered some of them by saying, yes, come tomorrow. And we answered others by saying things by answering like, them. by answering them. That's right. Yes. Why would you want to uh, do that? It's a very common answer. Yeah, it was. Uh, there was a NetTalk user group meeting as well. Again, plowed through the questions, looked at all kinds of different things and got through the answers. So if you have Three. questions, Clarion questions in general, open webinars every Wednesday. If you have NetTalk questions, open webinar, um, user group webinars every Thursday. And those at the same time, eight, eight in the morning Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. And you get all your questions answered, all of them answered. Sometimes the answer is no. But they get answered. They do. I enjoy both of these webinars. I enjoy all the webinars. Why shouldn't I? Um, anyway, next week Bruce will be with us with the next X Files. There we go. Doesn't it? That's just like the way that that 
that it's it's not quite alliteration, the but it's kind of got the next yeah the next X file the next X. I like that. All right, and with that, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. we're here, Mike. We're here. We're, we're at your. Spot. Let me take control here. I need to share my screen. Yes, I'm going to steal it from you, John. And we're going What's to in share. the Q and A? There's some things in the Q and A. There are a couple. I, I just read the things in the Q and A. We'll we'll address those at some point, um, and and I'll okay. explain why um, uh, the they may be uh, not approaching it the way I would approach it normally. But uh, but we'll discuss those. But let me give a quick overview as to what we're doing first. If you tuned in last week, you would have heard that my son was writing a, a, a very simple little game in Python. And what this game was to do is to present a rectangular area and there would be an object in this area. And as you move your mouse towards the object, the object should run away from your mouse and automatically bounce off the walls and try and you know, avoid it and such things. And he was really struggling with trying to test it because it was just doing weird things and he couldn't, he found that it, just to force it to do some condition, like something would suddenly break and not work the way he thought it was, but he couldn't reproduce the situation. And I explained to him that what he really should be doing is modeling the behavior of this because the code he'd written was just like crazy all over the place um and it just and it was so difficult and so convoluted and i said you should really model the behavior of the various different things whether that's the arena that you're playing in or the object itself and and then write some tests to confirm that this thing will act the way you expect it to act in certain situations so you basically set up the conditions and then you run the test and then you see whether or not the results uh, occurred that you expected uh, and then once you've got some amount of you know the, the logic going where you think maybe you've got enough that you can actually make it work um then you actually could put it into a real program see if it does something if you discover it doesn't quite work the way you want then you go back to your tests you write more tests to describe the conditions that you had just created and then confirm whether or not those tests are going to work uh, so yet yeah, last week we ended up going through and doing this. Of course, we're not doing it in Python because we're Clarion programmers. So we're doing it in Clarion and Clarion has this phenomenal utility called Clarion Test written by Dave Harms. And the way Clarion Test works is you create a DLL uh, that confirms, uh, conforms to various different standards. Uh, it in, will include the Clarion Test global extension. And you create a series of procedures. You'll notice if I go to uh, module type, where is type, type, type category here? You'll notice that these are group procedures and test procedures using the Clarion test um, uh, extension or the Clarion test procedure templates, which are provided along with Clarion test itself. The group procedures, of course, are just there to group your various tests and then the test will belong to the procedures. Uh, so when we go back to regular procedure view, you'll see that I have here three groups. I have just a miscellaneous one that's going just to confirm, did I set up Clarion test properly? Is this DLL doing what it needs to do? And then once you do that, you proceed to do further tests. And in this particular uh, case, it's fairly simple because we have just the concept of an area and I want to test that an area has dimensions. That's all I want it to do. I also have a target shape that I'm going to be uh, trying to, to capture and touch with my mouse. Uh, so we had some tests with, uh, with the target and we wanted to test certain things like, what is the size of the, of the target? Where, where is the target? What's its position? Um, the anxiety level of the target, if I have the mouse at a certain point near the target, how anxious is it? Uh, and I believe we were we were doing with our anxieties, uh, we were checking to say if, uh, if it was right on top of it, right uh, at, at the center of the thing, then the anxiety was going to be 100. That's as anxious as it's going to get. But as long as you were at least 100 pixels away, uh, then the anxiety would be zero. Um, so it was uh, was fairly smart to do that. And then the anxiety, of course, is determined by distance and the distance. We even used the Pythagorean theorem and, and quoted the Wizard of Oz last week uh, to do that calculation. And so we got the anxiety working quite nicely. We were just about to move on to the concept of reacting. Uh, and when you are writing unit tests, and, and I covered this last week, uh, you always want to start by writing some code 
that initially will call something that could potentially not even exist. So you might get a compile error uh, when you first write your test. And then you write just enough code so that the thing compiles, but the test still fails because the thing that you just wrote a basic bit of code for doesn't do anything yet. And then you proceed to try and make it do something to, to get to the point where your test actually runs and then and, and, and says, yes, I was fine. Uh, and then it proceeds to, uh, you then go ahead and write the next test, just going through the cycle over and over. And optimally, you should try and make that cycle as quick as possible. Uh, you'll hear various different you know, time periods between, that should happen once every two minutes. You should write a test and write some code and prove a test. And I've heard five minutes, I've heard 20 minutes. I don't think it's really critically important what the actual amount of time is, although generally speaking, what you want to do is you want to try and make those cycles as small as possible because each time you're writing a test, really what you're trying to do is just get a little bit more incremental behavior done, just a little more piece, a little more piece. And then if a lot of times when you're changing the various different classes and methods that you've got to, to prove out these tests, you will make some change in your in your stuff and suddenly not only does the test you're currently trying to get pass not pass but suddenly a bunch of other tests will start failing when they were working just fine before and as long as you are making very incremental changes you'll go oh okay i know what i just changed i can go back and fix it what you don't want to do is you don't want to spend three hours changing code, writing code and then go back and discover you just made a change that breaks all of your tests because what did you just do that broke it? Uh, and this is why as much as possible, you want each individual test to test some very small difference, which is why you'll notice, for example, in the anxiety thing, we actually were creating a bunch of tests here. We first of all said, if it's coincident, I just want it to return 100. And all of our, all our code did is it basically just said, yeah, it's, a, it, it's the same place. It's in the same place as 100. Done. Uh, and then as we went on, we said, okay, well, let's get it to be you know, one pixel away down. Uh, and when it does that, you want it just to return 99 because it's one pixel away. So suddenly we could say, oh gosh, it's just going to be 100 minus the distance away. But then when we started doing diagonally and such things, we had to start bringing into, into to play the Pythagorean theorem. So our code that figured out what is our anxiety slowly morphed to become something different. Uh, and, and that is generally how you, you end up uh, writing code. Uh, and then of course, when we said we're 100 away, it said, I'm perfectly calm. But then we wrote another test that said, what if I'm 200 away? And suddenly it was returning negative 100. And what, well, hold on, wait, what is negative 100 in anxiety? It should just be zero. So this whole progressional sense of, of writing tests uh, really just helps you to understand how you go from something very simple and how when you make changes in your code, generally speaking, your code changes are going to be fairly small. And But then every once in a while you go, wait a second, I suddenly have to bring in Pythagorean theorem and we refactored our whole method. We broke a bunch of our earlier tests because we realized that, hey, we wanted this to be a little bit different. Uh, but as you went along, you suddenly said, hey, now I can refactor code. And in writing these tests, you are safely putting yourself in a situation where you can refactor code without feeling fear. You know that if you make a change to your code, it, you've got a bunch of tests that are going to prove that your code with all the normal ways still functions the way you expected, even after all of the major changes you made. So it gives you great confidence to do things like refactoring. And it also gives you lots of practice doing things like refactoring uh, so that after a while, you don't even get anxious yourself when you are refactoring code. So this is the goal. The next step we were going to go on to now is we have this concept of, uh, I don't think we're at the point yet where we could actually pop it up on a screen. Um, the, the next step we had is, okay, we can tell how anxious a block is, but what we really want is we want the target to start moving. So we said, okay, we, we want the target to not only be anxious, but we want it to react. Uh, and we started writing a couple of unit tests, and I think neither of them well, I think the first one probably did work here. Um, so we were just initializing our target and saying, you are at five, five, and you are one pixel high and wide. We said, okay, react if the cursor is at 105 and five. So it's 100 away from you. So it should be the case where you don't want to react at all. You'll notice the way I'm testing the, the, the reaction here is I'm saying, tell me where you are now. And if you are in the same place you were before, in terms of the X anyway, 
I want you to, um, uh, th then you obviously have not reacted. And then we said, okay, well, what if I was like one away from you? Where are you going to go? And I'm saying, well, I wanted to move 50 away. I realized during the week, this is not the right kind of test to write because we don't want it to immediately react and jump 50 pixels away. That would be, yes, it would be a reaction. But if we think of our game working in real time, we want it to begin moving away. So what we really want is we want a velocity. We want a direction. Where are you going to move to? And we want a speed. Um, so we, we get this sense as to, I know where you'd like to go. Uh, and I know um, how fast you're going to be moving. And then what will happen is with each incremental mouse timer thing, it will move that far based upon how anxious it is. So really wanting, what we want to know is we want to know how fast are you going to run away um, if we gave you one step? Is that going to be a big step or a small step? So, so that's really what we want is not the X, but we want the speed that you're going to run away. And, because we get really break this into two pieces. We want not only, we, we do want velocity, velocity ultimately, and velocity is by definition speed and, and uh, direction. Um, if you think of it as an arrow, I'm going this fast, that direction. Um, but in reality, and, and because we have speed and direction, we can test each of those things separately. And that's what we're going to do. So rather than X, I'm going to, um, I'm going to do this as, uh, what am I thinking here? I'm going to do this as, a, well, let's, we'll probably test direction first. Or actually, you know what? It's probably easier to test speed because speed is one step removed from, um, uh, from anxiety. If you're really anxious, you're going to want to go fast. Uh, in fact, there's probably almost a one-to-one -one correlation uh, between your anxiety level and your speed level. So what we will do is we're going to get speed. And initially, when there's no reaction, we want it to go very slow. And then what we want to do is we want to check, and, and we're going to be having this concept of a maximum speed that it's going to move. And that's if we have the timer tick to set up once every, or a timer of one, of course, will be roughly 100 uh, timer events per second. So you think, what's the most we would want to go? At this point, I don't even know what that number is going to be. So I'm just going to pick a, pick a value at random and say the maximum speed I'd want it to go is maybe five pixels, possibly uh, uh, per tick. So let's uh, let's just say it's equal to five. But I also recognize at this point that this is going to be a variable thing. So the first thing I want to do is I actually want it to have a maximum speed that it could go. So we are now going to, uh, when we initialize this uh, target, we are going to add another parameter, and it's going to be 5. And let's just make a few notes here. x equals 5, y equals 5, width equals 1, height equals 1, speed equals 5. And then the first test we're actually going to do is we're going to say t get speed or get max speed is what we want. And then we're going to assert that the max speed is equal to five. Max speed. So we just added a new test in here. So let's go ahead and compile this. And as I explained, a lot of times, the first time you, when you write some code, the code doesn't even exist. We don't have a max speed and, and get speed uh, methods in here. So let's go ahead to our target. Let's say in here, we're going to say get max speed procedure long and get speed procedure long. OK, we now have two new methods. And let's go over here and let's come to here, da, 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 go here. Return self dot max speed. Okay. And here we'll go code and we're going to return um, negative one because we don't really do anything here yet. We haven't got any logic. 
So we'll start out with, uh, this should now make our thing compile. Although I have a feeling it won't, nope, it didn't. And why is that? Well, it's saying, hold on, your initialization method doesn't ever allow five parameters. So we need to now go in and fix that. So we're gonna say get init, init, init is here. And then we're going to say, um, is going to be an optional parameter, and this is going to be a long max speed. So we'll go back to our init method. It's up here somewhere. There we go. And we're going to have max speed, and we're going to say self dot max speed equals max speed. And in fact, you know what we should do is let's make this instead of being an optional parameter, let's make it a default parameter. Let's just assume that five is the value. I was considering putting the max speed as defaulting it in the constructor. And then I realized, hey, you know what? I can just do it right here. So let us go back to uh, our ink file. And we're going to make this here a long max speed equals five. Uh, and just to, to point out here, when you have a default parameter, uh, it is not an optional parameter. It's actually always there, but if you don't pass it, Clarion passes it for you, which means within your method here, you could not say if omitted max speed because it will never be omitted. It is actually injected by the compiler either because you told it what to use or it uses the, the five default. Uh, so you can never check if it's omitted. So just thought I would uh, mention that. It's worthwhile knowing that. Uh, so we're doing that, just set those up nicely. Let's go ahead and try and compile it again. It's still gonna fail. Uh, and the reason it's gonna fail is we've fixed the init method so that they can pass the parameters, but you'll notice that there is no max speed property yet. So we come in here and we say max speed is another long protected. And you know what would be nice is I I could see that in our game at some point we'd be at, want to be able to tweak this at runtime and say you know what you're going too fast for me I'm I'm frustrated I want you to go a little bit slower so we have a get max speed let's create a set max speed as well so we're there and we'll come back to we should copy that bring it over here. Let's find our max speed, get max speed, set max speed, self dot max speed, speed equals max speed. So we've now got a setter and a getter for max speed. And because we've got a setter, we should never set it directly ourselves because there might be logic inside the setter that needs to not only set that internal value, but adjust other things. So whenever that value changes, there may be logic associated with that change. So in this case, we're just going to say self dot set max speed to whatever the max speed was that was passed in. Let's go ahead and try and compile this again. And it came up and it said, uh, so on React, it's complaining about no reaction test not working. It expected five and it actually received negative one. So let's go look at the test that's just failed. What that means is we actually didn't succeed with this and we should have changed this test uh, because we set it to be five, but we really want to check to make sure that it got the five. So we're going to go back first and just confirm that this test really does test whether or not max speed got its correct value. So let's just run that real quick and we just want to check to make sure that it fails on max speed which it did expected a 15 and of course it was five because that's what we really told it to be and that is one of the steps with the unit test you always want to make sure that you, your unit test can fail if your unit test never fails it gives you a sense of self confidence uh, false confidence it makes you think that hey the whole world's fine when it may not be fine uh, if it turns out that our getting uh, our, our initializing of the max speed was not correct this test would not have told us that. So now we've confirmed that it really does know how to set the max speed internally. And yes, in this code we're writing right now, it's stupidly simplistic. And you're going, of course, obviously. What I'm trying to show is these are the steps you want to go through because you don't want to get a sense of false confidence. Your tests 
are there to make you confident. So you want to be confident that when the conditions are bad and the test isn't and, and the code isn't working, you want to know that your test will confidently and consistently tell you that. So it is important to know that your test can fail before they succeed. You have to fall before you can stand up and start walking. And when you start running, you better fall down again before you know you can run consistently and safely. Same, same concept applies here. So if you recall, when we tested it uh, before we uh, made our max speed test fail, uh, it came up and it said, I got no reaction. So why is that? And then we realized, oh, we used to be checking for X to make sure that it hadn't moved. What we really want to do is we want to be checking for speed and the speed should be zero. You're not trying to run anywhere because I'm too far away. So let's try that again. And interestingly enough, it still failed. You go, oh, wait a second. Is that right? And you go, oh yeah, because it's getting speed. And if you recalled when we were in our speed code, get speed always returns negative one because we haven't written any logic there yet. Good. Okay. So our speed is going to be dependent upon our anxiety. So we have self.anxiety.get anxiety. And it's based upon the X and Y of the mouse. So what we really should be doing is we should be passing in the, those same parameters. So let's go ahead and change the this React concept has X and Y and get speed has got X and Y. So let's go back and we're gonna say get speed and it's passing in X and Y or let's get max speed. Get speed is what we want right here. And let's go back and go to compile. And of course it's going to complain because get speed does not have a position. So it's really these parameters here that we want to be calling in. So we're no, no longer calling react directly. Now we're passing in the parameter of the mouse directly to the get speed method. Now let's see what happens. And we're still getting an error. Where's the error from? Oh, okay. So this is where we started writing our code. So we're going to get the anxiety and let's just save that. A is anxiety. This is going to be long. Just So it's get anxiety and it wants the X and the Y. And really all of these should be mouse X and mouse Y, shouldn't they? So let's just quickly tweak those. And why? Oh, hold on. And this is actually not. This is setting the position of the item itself. But getting speed and get, getting the reaction are all mouse x, mouse y. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to have mouse x is part of getting the speed and getting the reaction. And most why is this, because of course, having parameters that tell a story is a useful concept. So we wanna be consistent there. Uh, and if we were really being pedantic, we could go ahead and we could say, this should be target X and target Y. But I think in the concept of saying, hey, target, set your position to X and Y, I think that's pretty clear. But when we're saying, hey, target, react to the mouse being here. Oh my goodness, what are you gonna do? Uh, so that makes sense. There, mouse X, mouse Y. And what we want to do is, what if we just returned, I don't know, is this going to work here? Let's just uh, get anxiety that. Oh, and I just realized I'm in the wrong spot here. Actually, this is good here. But this is going to be long because anxiety we've discovered is, well, maybe it's a real. Maybe we'll eventually make it. Uh, in fact, I think it might even be a real. It is. In fact, look at our, our anxiety is a real. Uh, so we're doing this and then we're coming down. And where's our other code here? So this getting a speed is the same concept. It's a real and we are getting the anxiety like this. And then just for now, let's return A. Let's return the anxiety. 
is that kind of sort of what we want? Well, it's closer. And okay, uh, real close is failing. And this is not really React, this is actually speed. So we're gonna change the name of our, our test as well because I realized our test is not well named here, speed. Uh, and real close failed. So interestingly enough, um, when we asked for the speed, when we were 100 away, it said, I'm not going anywhere. So that actually worked. Cool. We actually got wrote enough code to get our first test to work. But now it's failing on our second test. We're saying if we're one away, then we are have a, have a um, anxiety. In fact, you know what? Why don't we just tell it to go right on top here? Let's go 5 comma 5. That's an even better one. Um, and this is going to be coincident. Coincident. And uh, and if it's coincident, then we'd probably expect it to go to the max speed. But let's initially just set it for. Well, we know it's it's failing already, so we'll just leave it like that. And then this one will go back to being four comma five. And this is going to be something other than five. Let's pretend it's going to be slower. So let's make it three or something two. So we're going to assume this is going to be two. Uh, so here the reaction was saying no reaction if we're far away. If we're right on top, you better go as fast as you can. So we wanted to go five. So let's check to see whether or not that worked. And you'll see that when it was coincident, sitting right on top, we want it to be five, but it's 100. And of course, the reason it's 100 is because when we look back at our code, you'll see that all it does is it re returns the anxiety. And of course the anxiety level is equal to hundred. What we really want to do is we really want to return the anxiety. And then we have this concept of self that max speed, uh, which is that local thing. So what we want to do is if our maximum speed is five and we get hundred, we need to divide uh, the uh, we need to basically do a ratio. So our anxiety 100 would be maximum. So we have to do a ratio of 100. The maximum anxiety and our real anxiety is going to give us a ratio. And then it's that much of a speed concept. Uh, in fact, you know what? I think for speed, I actually want it to be a real and not a long because it could potentially say, I'd like to go that fast that way. And depending upon if it's going at an angle, we may actually get a, a, an average that, that uh, works out a little bit more smooth if it's returning a real. So we're going to return changes to be a real. And then we're going to go back here and we're not returning the speed as is. Um, we are saying we now need to know what is the maximum anxiety. And you'll notice here, we just arbitrarily said it's a, this is 100 minus the distance. Okay, well, now what we really need is max anxiety because we're going to start using this number, this number 100 in more than one place. And magic numbers are generally very bad because you look at that and go, well, what's 100 mean? Why are you using 100? It makes no sense. So let's put it in an equate. So we're going to say max anxiety, anxiety, equate to 100. So now we actually have, and in fact, let's make it 100.0. So it's clearly a real. And now it's just going to say max anxiety minus the distance. Uh, and then up here where we're doing this, we're going to say it's equal to uh, the, the speed we're going is going to be uh, the anxiety divided by the max anxiety. Uh, and then it's times the maximum speed. And that should give us the right number. So let's go back here and we'll run this. And hey, our initial one worked now, uh, but now we are saying we expected two for the speed because it's real close. So it's not gonna go maximum speed, but it's gonna go pretty darn close to it. Um, so it received 4.95. And I go, well, you know what? That makes sense because that's what our, our actual formula should be. It should be um, the maximum speed times uh, one one hundredth of that of that possibility um so and one one hundredth of, of uh, five is 0.05 so that's how much is decreased 
So uh, what we're going to say see here is we're saying, yeah, well, maybe it's two. But of course, it's not two. But we specifically wanted that to fail because, uh, sorry, down here. Uh, so really what we're doing here is this is going to be, um, and I think what I'll do here is I'm going to say, I'm going to have my own max speed here, max speed. You know, there. And then we're going to just make this into a, a long five. And I'm doing it this way so that my tests, and this is something that I, I'm always debating with myself. You know, when you write a test, is it okay to use a bunch of magic numbers? I've got fives all over the place here. It starts getting confusing as to what is five. So I say, you know what? Five is my max speed. Uh, so now I'm going to say, get the max speed is equal to whatever the max speed was supposed to be. Um, and then we're getting the speed. This is still location things. Um, this is going to be five, which makes sense because if we're right on top of it, we want it to be the maximum speed. And then here it's the maximum speed uh, divided by a hundred. Or actually that's not even true. It's the maximum speed divided by the maximum anxiety. Um, so it's, it's five divided by a hundred. And then at that point, uh, we need to know what is max maximum anxiety. and you remember we put an equate for maximum anxiety. We put it right here. Problem is this equate is not accessible outside of the class file because that's where we defined it. So we can change it here. We're gonna make this accessible. Um, and we could put this here instead. But you know what? Uh, if we, as soon as we do that, then we go, hold on, maybe I have a, something called max anxiety. Now, of course, this is a rather strange name. I don't know how many of your programs would have something called max anxiety. Um, but generally speaking, as soon as you do it here, it means this is going to be included everywhere. And this is now a global symbol. Is that an okay name for that global symbol? If you start typing max and you see max anxiety and you're like, where did that come from? So we would have to then uh, come in and say, okay, you know what? Uh, this is something part of M target. So maybe we should say MT underscore max anxiety. So that's one option. Uh, and that would be fine. Uh, the other option is we, uh, we make this target tell us what is the maximum anxiety you can have. Um, because, and it just always returns the same number. And it just gives us a window into, uh, into the class and how it functions. Uh, so let, why don't we do it that way instead? I like that. So there, max anxiety, and then here, and really it's completely up to you as to, to which direction you go. Uh, but I like the idea of, of being able to um, ask a class, hey, uh, tell me about yourself, what's going on? Um, rather than having a huge number of, of things. Now, if, if there are a whole bunch of different values and we had to use these values in code in a lot of places, I'd say, sure, you know what, let's, name them properly and put them directly in the include file because I'm going to be using these equates everywhere. But in this case, the only reason, really big reason that I need this is for the sake of my test to be able to do some proper calculations. So I'm going to have get, uh, we've got gets max speed, let's get max anxiety. And you know what, because speed is a real, well, but max speed will just assume doesn't need to be a real, it can be an integer, it's fine. So get max anxiety is also going to be uh, a, uh, a long as well. So get x, y, da, 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 max speed, max anxiety. I did want to do that. Return max anxiety, there. So now we have a method we can use for that. So let's go in and do uh, this thing where we say, instead of divided by 100, we're gonna say max speed divided by um, T get max anxiety. Because we know that the, uh, the value should be this. And, and the reason I'm doing this is because um, I like the code to read, even in my tests, I want my tests to read 
pretty closely to what my typical code would be. So as soon as I see too many magic numbers in place, like this is fine, it's just some dimensions, yeah, whatever. Um, but seeing these things kind of sort of bugs me. Uh, but I say, you know what, it's fairly defined, it's fairly con controlled in this one little spot. But as soon as I get too many fives and I was getting this concept of max speed and this and that, that just started freaking my mind out. And I said, hold on, I wouldn't want to have to come back and make sense of this code later. Uh, now, if we wanted to really make these tests readable, what we should be doing, just for reference sake, I'll just show you that what I would do if I was being very specific, mouse X long, mouse Y long. And then here I would say mouse X equals 105, mouse Y equals five. And then I would actually just specify mouse X mouse y. And that's actually a great code, uh, the way that is written right like that. And you know what, I think I'm going to change these other two to match. Oops, I'm going to four, five, and five, five. Okay, yep. Four, five, and five, five. Now, is this gonna work? We just changed a whole bunch of code, but I think it's gonna work. No, nope, didn't. Expected 0.05. Oh gosh, I wrote a stupid test. My test was not right. Because my little thing divided by the max anxiety, what it really is doing is it's saying the max speed divided by the max anxiety is the amount that it decreases below the max speed. So I have my uh, target get max speed minus how much does it decrease because you're really close. Your max speed divided by how much anxiety. So at this point, the test now knows a fair bit about how the internals of the class work. And if this were regular code uh, that I was writing, I'd be a little more concerned. Uh, because the regular code should not know too much about how the innards of your classes work. Uh, they want to just depend upon them to do it. But in this case, we're writing unit tests. And the unit tests will, generally speaking, be trying to test aspects of the way your code works uh, that are pretty specific uh, and pretty personal. Uh, to those particular classes, and as such, I'm I'm willing to go. Uh, I'm willing to go a little bit further to do this. And apparently, I've got a, a typo in here. Mass speed, not here. Let's check this. No, I'm not sure where he's seeing that. He says you have a, another formula in the class. There is a star mass speed at the end. Really. Mass. Oh, there's max. Mass. I don't see a mess. Okay, we will proceed onwards, uh, Wolfgang, and uh, and see whether or not we run into a problem with that. So we've now made that change. Let's see if that actually compiles and gives us proper unit tests. Function. Yeah, maybe this will find it. T get speed minus max speed. Why is it complaining about? T is it do we not have a get speed? Ah, of course, get max speed. It should be get max speed here. So what's the maximum speed minus? Uh, and because we just asked the class what the max speed is, and we realize, hold on, we know that those two are the same. We just tested them above. I don't actually have to call the the, uh, the classes thing. I could just say max speed minus the max speed divided by the anxiety. And you'll notice here we're doing this calculation this way. What is the max speed minus the max speed divided by the anxiety? But if you looked at the class, how is it doing the max speed? It is, uh, it's getting a speed. It's saying, what is the anxiety? And then it's, well, it's doing it similarly, but it's actually taking the, the anxiety, using that to create a ratio with the max speed and then multiplying that by the max speed. So it's doing the calculation very differently. And that's, kind of interesting you know it's a uh, uh, we could theoretically if we wanted to change our formula to say that instead uh, but first of all I want to see does it actually work 
and everything works fine. Now, Max is saying I've got something. Oh, I think he's maybe just saying I've got an extra variable that I'm not using. Get speed in dot get speed. Okay, here's get speed. So where is my, huh, weird. I'm not sure what you're seeing, Wolfgang. <laughs> Do you have a line number for me? <laughs> Yellow the line number and I'll, and I'll stare at it again and we can see whether or not it's actually, uh, actually hitting here. Um, but we know the code's compiling. So I may have extra code that I don't need somewhere, uh, but for the moment anyway, that seems to be fine. Now you'll notice here, I just want to point out, uh, I could have taken this and used this directly here, but that would have made a very a much more complicated thing to read there because you've got a function call with a bunch of parameters and then it's being divided by something else. 67, max, max speed. This is perfectly fine. Um, the um, so the one thing you might be thinking it should be is max or sorry uh, Wolfgang is you should be you may be thinking it should be like this get max speed. And and this is an interesting interesting point to to argue. Um, we, I mentioned earlier if you have a setter and you want to change that value of that thing internally you should use the setter. Even if it's within your same class, you should use your setter because maybe something needs to happen when the value of that thing changes. Now, in the case of just using the value within the class where that value exists, um, if, if you are talking about that, is there any benefit to using this line? And really that would, uh, it, it, and it, it comes down to, is there any chance that your getter would do something, some kind of logic to figure out how to get the max speed? And now let's say for example, there wasn't an, inter an internal variable called uh, max speed. It, whenever you said, what's the max speed, it would do that dynamically based upon, you know, something I've decided that at noon, I can run a lot faster. So the max speed at noon is going to be different than the max speed would be at some other point in time. So at that point, there is no max speed variable that you could query. Um, in most cases, though, if there's just an internal variable and you just want to use that internal variable within the class itself, I'll just go ahead and use it directly. Uh, but I do tend to use the setters pretty consistently um, because uh, as I say, I may at some point in time decide I want to change other things. When I change that one value, that value could potentially have other impacts. Uh, and I like to have the, the setters uh, be called directly. But in this case, I think I'm more likely to, um, uh, I, to call that overkill. Nothing wrong with it, perfectly safe to do it that way. And maybe because it's perfectly safe, maybe it's a, there's no harm in just doing that. That's a good point. Let's call that one settled. It's an argument, got into an argument with myself and I proved I was wrong. <laughs> and right at the same time, isn't that wonderful? Uh, so hopefully we've addressed that and dealt with it. Um, okay, uh, and maybe that's what Max or what Wolfgang was talking about uh, in terms of the, uh, of the issue with it. Uh, it was right, but maybe not the best thing it could be. We do have a getter, let's go ahead and use it. Really the only downside is it takes slightly longer to call this function than it does just to use the value directly, but that is so inconsequential. Uh, I don't think uh, the speed of this thing is gonna be an issue. So there we go, let, we just made a change to our code. Let's make sure our tests still work. Okay. Okay. So now we have speed working. Now we have to figure out direction and direction is kind of an interesting thing because uh, it depends upon where we're coming from. And I think we'll probably be okay in that regard. Um, but we're going to test it anyway. The direction, if you think about, you know, this, let's say for example, this button, the save button here is my target. So if I'm moving in from the bottom, what direction is it going to want to go? It's going to want to go opposite from wherever I'm going. So at any given point in time, the direction is always going to be opposite to the mouse. Um, now, we, let's go ahead and create a new test here. So we're going to uh, copy that. 
Actually, we won't do that yet here. Let's just go to target test. Let's say calls, and we're going to add a new procedure, and it's going to be called 205. And if you remember, I'm I'm doing these naming them with an open underscore uh, as the first character uh, because I would like to have these numbered, but you can't use a number as the first character of your procedure labels. Uh, so I put an underscore in there instead, and then I put a three-digit number, another underscore to parse it off, uh, and then we're going to say direction, and we're going to add that. And then there, I'm going to just copy that label. And then I'm going to copy this procedure and give it the new label. And there we go. So this, this should just work as is because it's just a repeat of the other one initially. So let's just confirm that compiled. Yep, except direction is a little different. Now, if we're asking it direction, uh, what are we really doing? It's not actually the direction it's saying if I move you one, if I give you one timer tick, where you're going to show up. This is similar to the concept of the React before, but it brings into play the idea of the speed as well as the idea of where you wanting to go. So this is really not direction so much as uh, th this is really back to the to the original movement. Um, uh, so this we could really go back to calling this React if we want to. Um, because we're going to say react now tell me where you are so let's change the name of this thing uh, react so we've got this a similar situation we've got a max speed uh, we don't have to assert that that works anymore because we're testing it else elsewhere uh, let's say we're far away and then i want you to react t dot react uh, and it's reacting to the mouse X and the mouse Y. And then I want to assert that. Um, and we're going to assert that uh, we're going to start doing two things here. And initially, let's just get rid of this code entirely. So we're going to assert. And now in this case, we are going to be checking for X because we're going to say we've given you a chance to react. Now I want to find out where you are. And you should be at the same place you were before. So you should be at whatever the mouse X is. Uh, and then no reaction X. And then we want to check, get check Y. And we're going to say is equal to the mouse Y. And we want no reaction Y. And again, we want this to fail initially. So let's go ahead and just give this a a wonky value to make sure it can fail. Um, and we expected 106 and we received five. Oh, well, that definitely failed. Okay. Uh, and the reason it definitely failed is I said, I want you to be at the mouse that I just told you. And of course, it's not going to be at the mouse. It's going to be at the same original position it was at. So in reality, this is really going to be not moving at all. So let's say it's really five. Um, so let's just make sure that works. Okay, and now it's failing on the Y, which is what we'd expect. So let's say, where are we here? Oops. So it's not moving. It's still the 5.5 five that it started itself at. Uh, so now we check that. Is this going to work? And it worked just fine. Okay. So now we've got that, let's go on to the next step. Now we're going to put the cursor right on top. And we're going to, in fact, you know what? Let's just copy this down here like this. So now we're moving right on top of this thing and we wanna see where are you gonna move? Now, this is an interesting thing. We've said, well, you know what? Let, let, let's, before we do this one, let's, let's, uh, um, we're going to make this one instead of no reaction, we're going to make this real close. Um, and we're going to uh, if you do four and five. Now, if you think about this, we want this thing, if the mouse cursor is at four, it's one to the left. So we want the new position to be over to the right. So it's going to be potentially at six. Uh, and 
let's go here and real close X and real close Y. Let's just force this to be some wonky value to start with, just so we make sure it will fail. Uh, so we're saying, I want you to go to, I'm expecting this thing to move to the right and I want it to move to the right because we're very close. I want it to move, uh, actually I want it to move the max speed is really what I want it to do. I want it to be equal to not six, but it's gonna be equal to five plus max speed because you're moving one tick. So I've come out really close and I want you to move the maximum, except maybe not the maximum, it'll be a little bit less than that because we're not right on top. But let's just assume for the time being, we want it to be the max, because again, we want it to fail the first time. Um, so let's just go ahead and see what happens when we do this. We expected 10, which was five plus the maximum speed, and we received five, it hasn't moved at all. So it's obviously not working, but that's fine because again, we write the test, we want the test to fail. And now we look at it and we say, let's take a look at React and go, hey, hold on, that's right. We haven't got any code here yet. So if the anxiety is greater than zero, then we wanna move. And how fast are we gonna move? Well, we are going to move based upon a reaction to the distance that we're moving. And perhaps we wanna make this, uh, we said one pixel away, yeah, you know what, that's fine. Um, think about this. If it is one pixel away, it's going to be close to the maximum speed, but not quite. But one pixel away is still pretty darn close. So we, uh, so we may end up still moving by the time we average it out, it's gonna be one pixel less a little bit, but then it's gonna get rounded up and it's done. So it's probably gonna move that maximum speed at, at this particular rate is, is my expectation. So let's go ahead and say, we've got the anxiety and now we need to figure out the speed first of all. So speed is, uh, is it real for speed? Yes, real. So if the anxiety is greater than zero, then we're gonna say self equals, um, and do we even need to check the anxiety? We actually don't because the speed is based upon the anxiety. We don't care what the anxiety is. We just care, is there a speed that we have to move? So really we don't need the anxiety at all. We're gonna say get speed. And then S equals speed. And then if speed is greater than zero, then we're gonna move it. So how much do we move it? Well, we have to have a distance and distance is always speed over, um, well, you know what, we know it's one time slice so we don't have to bring time into place. But we are going to say the speed is how much we wanna move it basically at, in this time slice. Uh, so the speed is gonna be equal to, now if it was maximum uh, anxiety, it's going to, well, we already know the speed. So the speed is just gonna be, uh, actually let's just return, um, Mouse X plus, well, we don't know if it's mouse X or Y yet, do we? Okay, we need to think about where we wanna go. And this does bring an interesting point here. So it's really dependent upon the actual distance. So we need, we have a mouse X and a mouse Y, and then we have our X and Y. And this gets into a little bit of funny math here because what we're trying to do is we're trying to move away, but let's not make it too complicated first. Let's just assume that we're trying to get this first test to pass. Let's not try and write the whole logic right off the bat. It's so tempting to say, oh, I know eventually I'm gonna have to do this. So I'm just gonna write all the code to do all of these options right off the bat. Let's resist that urge. Uh, this is unit testing in action. And we're gonna try and follow the rules as much as we can. So let's just return mouse x plus, well, and we could even have a check here. We could say if mouse y equals, uh, well, you know what? Let's just add, let's just do mouse x. Return mouse x plus, um, and we want self dot, or just s. Yeah, let's just do that. In fact, we don't even need to do that. Let's do that. Did that work? That's the simplest code we could possibly write. Oh, hold on. So, react, ah, okay. That's so we have to say. We have to say self.set or self.x equals. We don't have setters and getters for our position, but we only let people control them with, uh, well, that's an interesting point. 
uh, we do have a setter for position. So let's say self dot set position. And this is important in this case to call it because when we change the position in an actual game, it's going to physically move the thing on the screen. So we definitely want to call this thing because this is probably going to be a virtual method. So we're going to call set position. The new x is equal to uh, self x plus s plus the speed. We're not even considering, we're using x and mouse x and y to get the speed, but let's just ignore it for the moment. Let's just say, now that we've got the speed, let's just use it. So we're setting that position. We're gonna say self dot y there. Uh, now that we've done this, as I say, I just pointed out that the, um, the set position is a, um, it should be a virtual method when we're setting the position. So let's just, now that we're thinking of it, let's make it virtual because when we change the position of our thing, we should um, see it move on the screen. So that's a good thing to have that as a virtual method. So we'll go back to our test and let's see, did this test work? I have no idea if it's gonna work or not. Expected 10 or received nine. Hey, that's kind of cool. Didn't really expect that. Uh, okay. Does, does that make sense? Okay, well, our X was, it was just to the left and we wanted it to move to the right. So that was pretty cool. That was close, but it, we expected, remember I was talking about rounding and we're at like 0.495, we should have moved five. So, ah, okay. Clearly the mistake was we didn't round. So now let's do a round on this and go round that thing. Oh, and I think there is, I think round takes uh, what do you want, what kind of thing do you want to round it to? So we're going to do the the amount that we're moving, comma one. So now let's test this. Are we going to get this to work? Receive fifteen. Oh, hey, look at now we we failed on our y, and of course our y is not valid. So let's um, we, we just wanted to make sure that failed. So now let's fail it. And now we're going to go. Da, 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 da. Where was it? The test oh, it was here. Why still 15? That is correct. Um, because we're not testing. We're just testing. What, can it move to the right? Does it know how to move to the right? If we're on its left, does it move to the right? That's all we're testing here. Uh, so let's go ahead and check that again. Yay, passed. Okay, let's uh, go on the other side of it. Can it move to the left? Module source file. What are we looking for here? Embeds. No, it's not embeds. Yeah. Just forgot my hotkey for a second. Okay, so that was, um, let's put a little comment. Uh, approach from the left. Approach from the right. So now we're going to say mouse x equals six. And now we want it to be five minus max speed. And Y is still gonna be there. Okay, so now it's gonna be, let's change the name of this thing from the left. From the right. There. So now we expect it to move to the left. If we're going from the right, then we're gonna be, where was your position? And now you're moving to the left. So let's see if that works. And of course it doesn't work because our code is stupidly simplistic. Right now our code just says, just take the X and add it, that's fine. And we don't like that. So now it's gotta be smart enough to say, hey, hold on, if it's on the left, I better move to the right and vice versa. So we're gonna say if self dot X is greater than, greater than um, the mouse X, if we're on the right, then we wanna move to, is that right? If we're, no, if the mouse is, yeah, if we're, if we're to the right of the mouse and I'm, I'm gonna change this, I'm gonna say if mouse, X is less than that because it shows that the mouse X is on the left-hand side of the X. So we know the mouse is on the left, mouse on the left. <laughs> and we will set the position like that. 
else if else if there if the and now here move the other way and now we go mouse on the right and you can visually see that it's that way i think that was not quite right there we go uh, so now it's going to set the position for this minus the speed. We changed just enough of our code to get this to run, I think. We received 15, most on the right. So we expected zero, most on the right. Interesting. I don't, didn't expect that. So we expected zero and we receive 15. Does that make any sense? Most five minus back speed. Ah, right, because our numbers are too small. Uh, so the fact that we've now gotten bitten by the fact that our uh, numbers are not correct here. So let's go five, let's change this to 50 and 50 there. Um, That'll make it well, except that it could, yeah, the maximum it's going to move is a five, so 50 is plenty. So we'll go 50, 50, and then let's just see how many of our tests that breaks. So no reaction is broken, of course. Uh, so we have to now change no reaction to what is expected, and expects it to be in the same place it was before. Similar situation here, let's just these are probably all supposed to be 50, aren't they? I expect so. Let's see if this works. And it's still failing on no reaction. Interesting. So we've managed to break our no reaction test. Uh, 50 minus that, curious. Let's go back and see what we broke. Uh, so we get the speed. And then if the mouse is less than self x, if the mouse is less than the mouse, otherwise we're not changing it at all, then how in the world did that fail? Let's go back and look at our test here. We're expecting no reaction. It should be at 50. Ah, here's the problem, 50. And this should be, ah, because we're too close. So it wants to move it a little bit, right? Perfect, makes perfect sense. Uh, so it is uh, basically complaining because our conditions were no longer correct. We didn't move it far enough away. So let's just make it, uh, uh, it was uh, 155 there, or 150. That's really what it is. It's 100 away. That's what I care about I'm there. So now this is gonna be a similar situation. We need to add 50, actually add 45. It's gonna be 49 and 50. And then here is one above. So this is 51 and 50. And then we'll just frame this in for the moment. Just because we do want to test that on top concept. Now let's see if we manage to get our tests working again. And you'll often find this happens where you, uh, you've you got a bunch of tests, they work just fine. And then you go, oh, wait a second, I'm going to change something in my code. And you, then your tests fail. And then you realize, oh, heck, I've got to fix half my damn test to get it to work again, because I changed something so intrinsic uh, to the way it worked. And because my test was very, being very specific with how it expected things. And you realize, oh, now I have to touch my test a little bit to get it to work. Very typical of what happens. But that's why these unit tests are good, because they make you realize that I expected it to be a certain way and it's not anymore. That may be because you have truly changed the way it works inside and because there's this personal connection uh, between your unit tests and the, uh, and the classes, you will see this happening. So here we are. We have now got past the no reaction. We have got past the moving from the left. We're now back to moving from the right and we expected 45 because we're moving from the right. And strangely enough, we received 60. It's moved to the right. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so let's just confirm that we're moving from the right location. So here we are moving from the right. We're in position 51 and the thing is at 50 and we expect it to be 50 minus the max speed. 
So 50 minus 4, expect to be 45, and it's getting 60. Interesting. Let's take a look at our code again. So our x is less than this, and we're rounding x minus the speed, comma 1. Well, this is curious. So let's just, and in unit test, if you want, you can put stop statements. They're kind of handy. You don't want to put an assert. Assert will, uh, will confuse clearing a test quite a bit, but you can definitely put in a stop statement. So we're going to specify uh, stop and we're going to say self. Uh, self x. Yeah, that's what I want. Uh, so we're going to say self x equals self x. And we're going to say s equals s. And then we're going to look also at this round equals round. Let's see what happens here. x is 50, the speed is 0. Interesting, and round is 50. But didn't I just say that we're getting 60? That makes no sense. Let's look at our test again. Is our test get x from the right, x. 50 minus the max speed it should be 45. That would, would be what I would expect. Um, and t get x, and we're reacting to mouse. That's really, really odd. Well, you know what? Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time staring at this code. And, and I didn't mention earlier on, but I should have. Uh, I actually have a hard stop today uh, at 1.30, my time, which is uh, eight minutes from now. So I think rather than wasting a bunch of time fiddling through this, I think I'm going to leave it, because obviously we're not yet to the point where we can actually put this into code, but we're getting pretty close. I would say with maybe another half hour or so of writing some of these reaction tests to confirm that it will actually do something regardless of what direction I'm moving in from, uh, then we're going to go ahead and actually drop it onto a screen and start trying to play it and see if it does what we expect it to do. And then if we notice it doing strange behavior, we will then tweak the behavior, write more tests to confirm that those tweaks are going to work as expected. So we are mighty close to being able to actually play this game. We've not even had to write that many unit tests uh, to get it to that point. But you can see that we, we're actually developing a fairly significant class here. We've got 100 lines of code to do to, to model the behavior of this thing. And this code is very well constructed, constructed very well factored code uh, in terms of following all the rules of a proper class. And, uh, and, uh, it, and it's fully unit tested to make sure that it actually does all the stuff it's supposed to do. We just need to extend it a little bit further, in particular that reaction piece, so I will probably forge ahead a little bit uh, just to save you the drudgery of me going through and, uh, and working out all the details of that. So you'll see something a little bit further along next time uh, from where we are now so that we can, uh, we can go ahead. I, I will review any additional tests that I write for it uh, to, uh, so you can see the kinds of things that I'm checking uh, and understand why that's happening. But I, I think the key thing now is you understand the process of writing the unit tests to get the class to behave the way it should in a controlled environment. Uh, and then our next step, and this is something we will, we will step into uh, with the next session, which as we were discussing earlier, is going to be in October probably. Um, and we will go ahead and uh, put it in place on an actual working screen and, uh, and see what happens with it. So with that, I will stop sharing and hand the mantle back to, to the John Hickey. How are you doing, John? I'm doing good. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I, I, before we get too far, I will just make a couple of comments, a, a couple of uh, questions that did pop up very early on. Uh, Carl Burns asked uh, about using the debugger in Clarion test. Clar Carl likes using the debugger much more than I do. And in unit tests, I don't generally want to start jumping into a debugger. If I have something working strangely, I'll 
sometimes pop up a stop statement or I'll put in some assert statements because it's not asserts, sorry, uh, debug out statements. So I'll, uh, I tend to do most of my testing uh, and debugging like that. Um, although I do believe I have used the, the debugger. Of course, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be running Clarion test itself within the debugger. And then once it goes and, and runs the, the actual uh, test itself, uh, when it gets to the point in your code uh, where you want it to happen, uh, that'll work fine. Uh, the other option, of course, is you could always take your test code uh, and put it into a separate program. Just grab that one little test procedure, put it into a program all by itself and run the debugger and do it all normally if you want to. There's nothing wrong with doing that approach. So that's likely what I would do if I had to use a debugger is I would just take that one test and put it in another environment. Um, Rich was uh, asking, uh, he said, uh, would we be able to have the, uh, the test program, um, our unit tests actually pop up a screen? Uh, and then respond to events, uh, and then uh, and then do that. We can make it do that, and perhaps we'll try that at some point to see uh, to see what happens. Um, the the issue with unit tests is you want them to be completely hands free. You don't want to have to to touch them. You don't want them to have a user interface. So if a window is going to pop up and a user has to do something, that's not a good unit test. But a, a unit test certainly could be written that would open a window. A, a window would then respond to various things and then understand somehow when it was supposed to close automatically. Uh, so as long as you could automate everything that happens in that window, sure, that's entirely possible to do. Uh, no reason why you can't achieve that. Uh, so those are the two questions that did come up. Uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, hopefully I've addressed them sufficiently for the moment. Uh, maybe we'll try the little window opening thing. Maybe we'll have a need for it. Maybe we won't, but we might open it up just for fun, uh, just to see what happens when you do create a window and how you have to make sure that it closes automatically. Because again, unit tests are just going to be called. Eventually we'll also make Clarion test callable from the command line so that it goes ahead, runs all the tests and exits, spitting the results into a file because that's something that Mark Walgren wants. So we have lots of things to do going forwards. But for now, we are done. For now, we are done. Okay. Um, you had 28 views today, Mike. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's a little bit of a letdown from the 810 uh, from before, but you know. The most views I've ever had in a YouTube video is about 35,000. So there you go. Well, that's pretty good. Isn't that, yeah. that uh, you were doing, you were cooking something. Is that no, 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 no. So, so that, yeah. So for my cast iron one, I probably had 1500, but this was oh, okay. me talking about why my sump pump wasn't working because the standing <laughs> oh, pipe okay. had a little frozen clog up near the top. So okay. and for some there reason, 35,000 people thought it was worth watching that. So, so 800 is nice, but it's not 35,000. It's not 30. Yeah, and it's okay. not a million. Yeah, so there you go. It's not a million. <laughs> yep, it's not a million. All right, fair enough. So uh, next week, uh, regular schedule and um, at the countdown to see IDC mm -hmm. 2020. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. Yeah, me too. I really am. This is going to be this is going to be fun. And then after that, next year, got to start looking at CIDC 2023. Mm -hmm. In 2023. <laughs> In the actual year. <laughs> yeah. None of this you know, funny math stuff going on. Yeah, unless, you know, monkey pox takes over or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That or, or that new uh, shrew virus out of China that I read about earlier. <sighs> Let's not talk about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, we'll see you guys. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you guys around next week. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. You're ever so welcome. Bye, Have a great day.